This video is sponsored by Masterworks. If you missed the first video on the elevator table, this is a coffee table that goes to full dining room table height in a matter of seconds. Now, this was always intended as a prototype. Ashley and I have been testing it out. We actually even ate Thanksgiving dinner on this table, and it's not without its flaws. That's where version 2.0 comes in. This one is solid walnut, and although these two may look very similar on the outside, on the inside, they're entirely different. I redesigned this from the bottom up and it works so much better. I'm gonna take you through step by step how I built this, what sort of complications I ran into, Oops. and I've also built a full set of plans, so if you wanna build one, you can. comments of the last video I asked you guys to tell me what species of wood you wanted the next elevator table made out of and it was a resounding vote for walnut. I love walnut, I love working with walnut, almost every woodworker I've ever talked to says it's their favorite wood to work with. The only downside is it's also one of the most expensive domestic hardwoods you can buy here. So I ended up going with rough sawn lumber. The benefit of this is it's a little bit cheaper, but the downside is that you do have to mill it yourself. Now, when it comes to milling a tabletop, it's always good to mill it yourself anyway because you wanna get it as flat as possible and as free of defects as possible. So going through this milling operation, I really get to know these boards find all the flaws and then I can cut those out and figure out the best pieces to use to get the most attractive tabletop. The sides of these boards are still rough sawn from the mill and they need to be straightened out. Typically you'd use a joiner for this. I don't have a joiner in my shop and I've gotten away for a really long time just using my track saw for the first pass and then doing some progressive passes afterwards through the table saw, just nibbling away until both sides are flat. You may not get it on the first go, but, but as you sort of flip the board around, adjust the fence, you'll gradually bring it into square. A lot of people skip this step entirely and just glue it up from here. I'm gonna be adding some dominoes to it just because this is a really expensive glue up and I would love for it to go smoothly. So I added a whole bunch of dominoes just to make sure everything lines up. Uh, it is gonna add strength, but you technically shouldn't need that strength. An edge grain glue up is incredibly strong if it's done right. about 24 hours the stress of the glue up was behind me I was so relieved to see that the joints were nice and tight you can see that that joining technique does work can't even get a fingernail into the cracks I left the edges of the of the panel wild because I like to trim it up afterwards so I don't have to deal too much with alignment when I'm doing the glue up and then I'm just gonna set the tabletop aside. I don't need it yet in the build. The reason I started with it is because it's gonna use the most lumber out of this whole project. And so I figured I would get that out of the way, pick out the best boards, and then I can use all the remaining boards to build the remaining pieces. I'm starting in on the leg assembly here. These are gonna make up the four legs and these are gonna be the apron rails.
So this is what's called a tenoning jig. It passes through your saw. You can tilt it at different angles. But when I was thinking about uh, adding a plate here and adjusting it and stuff, I realized that most of you probably don't have one of these in your shops and um, I can't expect people to have one in the plans. So I'm gonna show you real quickly how to make one. Uh, it's pretty simple, especially to make just square bridle joints, which is what I'm doing for the legs. This style of tending jig is super simple to make and it just uses basically a sheet of scrap plywood. Uh, you cut a piece that is the width of the fence and a piece that is the height of the fence plus the thickness of the plywood and you screw that plywood in. You cut out another panel that's slightly taller and screw that into the other side. It's not smooth enough. Uh, I'll add a shim. I found that mine was a little bit too tight and so I used a cereal box as a shim and that was perfect. The last element you need to add is a backstop and this you just wanna make sure is square to your tabletop so you're cutting nice square joints. So in addition to having plans available for the elevator table, I've also put up plans for this tenoning jig, almfab.com slash plans. Included in that are the exact measurements for the saw stop T-glide fence. And if you have a different fence, I've shown how to change the math around so that you can make it work for your fence. Now this jig can be used to make tenons, obviously, but it can also be used to make bridle joints. I like to start by cutting the center out of it, and uh, this doesn't really have to be precisely measured because you're gonna match the other piece up to it. I like to flip the piece around so that I make sure that the cut is perfectly centered, and then when it goes to cutting the outer cheek cuts on the opposing piece, I cut from the outside in and gradually sneak up on the fit. So you see the first try doesn't usually fit, and that's a good thing because like I said, want to sneak up on that cut. Uh, but be mindful when you shift the fence over that it's going to double that measurement. So every time you shift it over, you're cutting it on both sides. So the measurement doubles, so you can, you can overcut it really easily. Just be careful. You can use a scrap piece of wood to test the fit first and then uh, cut your final piece once you've got it dialed in. With my bridle joints all fitted, I can now cut the taper on the legs. I'm using my Rockler taper jig as a handy way to do it. And uh, it's easy to set up and get repeated cuts so that all the legs come out the same. The reason I'm using bridle joints for these legs is because it provides a lot of surface area, which means that these legs are going to be super strong, even though they're pretty thin. Too much glue. Now, I, I have to admit that I did overcut my first bridle joint, exactly what I told you not to do. But uh, <laughs> the fix that I came up with was to add a shim of walnut veneer. This, is, this would have been entirely prevented if I'd started with uh, a test piece, but I was too lazy to do that. Um, and so as a result, here I am trying to cram a thin piece of veneer into a very tight fitting joint. Nah, it's not good. Amateur, amateur hour right now. Flip this over and hammer it home. That could work. So the veneering trick appears to have worked. I, I tried to check the um, the joints, and I, I honestly can't 
see which one has the veneer in it anymore. So I sanded it up really nice. Uh, it did work. I do not recommend going that route if you don't have to, but it's, apparently it's, a, it's an okay patch. So now it's time to add the stretchers in the legs. Uh, this is, all three stretchers are the same size and they go in with two dominoes on each end. Okay, so now we're getting into the mechanical part of the build, and this uh, is where it's gonna start looking a lot different than my original design. The, the big thing that I'm changing on the lift arms is that I've made them two inches shorter because I found that the original table was a little bit too tall. And then the other thing is that I've added a long sort of, I'm gonna call these the crab claws. One of the pincers is longer than the other one. And this is to prevent that hyper extension issue that I was talking about before. This claw will catch a lot quicker and uh, easier and kind of guide it into place. If you remember last time I put a domino on the outside edge, that was just kind of a band-aid. I'm hoping that this will be a much more elegant solution to the problem. I quickly mocked it up out of cardboard. It seemed like it was gonna work really well. So then I moved over to plywood. I made a couple subtle changes to the track system as well. I'm gonna be cutting this out on Shaper Origin, but uh, obviously with the plans, I'm gonna provide a template for people to follow if they wanna template route it. I'm also providing the SVG file, so if you have a CNC, you can cut it out on CNC as well. Uh, but this is just my mock-up to make sure that my redesign is working okay. The main changes that I made to the track is that I smoothed over the transition from the up position to the down position, and also made the track shorter because the tabletop is not as tall. I want the top pivot to come in contact with the apron rail exactly above where sort of the down drop is in, in the track, and that seemed to be working right. I really can't test it fully because I don't have the weight of the tabletop on it, and that kind of changes the dynamics of it, but I felt confident enough to start cutting the tracks out in the actual legs. So I saved the template that I made from the last build and it worked so well on the last build, but for some reason it was giving me trouble. It was not staying uh, true. So I, I kind of ended up drilling down at an angle. I don't know if it started to wear or the, the, um, the clamps shifted, but if I were to do this again, I would make a quarter inch plywood template first, drill that out, cut it to shape, cut this little rounded edge in it, and then just template route all of the legs. That would have been way easier than, than doing it this way, and it would have been perfect 
on all of the pieces. I was able to sand it out and it looked just fine, uh, but if you're gonna get the plans, I'll, I'll detail in there how, how to make a template uh, because I think it would work a lot better. Now it's time to round over all of the edges. I love this moment when you're working on a piece of furniture. I feel like this is the moment that it kind of comes to life. It starts to look like a finished piece. And after the round overs, I can start gluing together the leg assembly. One thing that I messed up on the last prototype was that I didn't check for square after this glue up and uh, this is the foundation of the entire table. It's pretty essential for it to be square. For fortunately this one was, was squared up really nice and all I had to do was leave it overnight to dry. Now moving on to what I'm calling the lift arms and I'm going to be cutting in those crab claws. These pieces will be template routed, so all I have to do is trace it out lightly uh, and then rough cut it. I'm gonna leave a good bit of, of wood on there, but I just wanna get rid of the bulk of it so that it doesn't strain the router bit. And then I can tape on my template and template route it to fit. In the plans, I've provided a, uh, a printable template. So you can just spray glue that down to a piece of plywood, cut that out, and then use that as your template to make your lift arms. Next step is to drill the pivot holes. This is what interacts with the track that I made on the Shaper Origin. And these don't get drilled all the way through, so I set the depth stop on my drill press and drilled them about a half an inch in. Note that these are mirrored parts, so half of them have it drilled on one side and then the other half have it drilled on the other side. For the upper pivot, I decided to leave these pieces long and then just measure it out from the dowel. Uh, this seemed like a, a more effective way to do it than the template. I'm not sure. You probably could just do this from the template if you wanted to. These get drilled all the way through and they get rounded over on the top. I, I can tell that there are some people wincing at using pocket holes on this piece of furniture and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out how I could do this without pocket holes. And in my head, I knew that this assembly had to be removed uh, somehow. And uh, I, asked, I asked people in the comments to, to say if they had another strategy for, for assembling this. And although I got a lot of comments on how I could put this together, uh, pocket holes seemed the most approachable from like a DIY standpoint. Um, but I was not happy with it and uh, in a minute you'll see how I discovered to fix it. So they're not in the final design, but uh, I did put them in initially because it, at the time it was the only solution that I had. The reason that I thought I needed pocket holes is because this little dowel has to go in to these sides and it basically has to be assembled in place. You could glue it in place, but if you ever needed to do maintenance on it, you couldn't get it out or that was at least what I thought at the time. But then when I was messing with it, I figured this out. <laughs> All right. Oh my god, I'm such an idiot. I don't need pocket holes. Why? Alright. Alright, that's apparently that's all it takes to remove them. So it turns out all you have to do is twist them to remove them and considering how much time I've spent just trying to puzzle this out for it to be that easy of a solution is wild. It just goes to show that sometimes you have to build something three times to get it to work. People often ask me about my background. I studied art in college and a good chunk of that education was centered around art history. I learned a lot about the artists and I learned a lot about the collectors. 
This video is sponsored by Masterworks and they have made it possible for people like me to invest in the artwork that I love. Buying and selling art has been a method of investing since the Renaissance and used as a store of value for wealthy families for generations. And it makes sense why the total wealth held in art is estimated to be worth $1.7 trillion. On top of that, the art market has been shown to behave independent of the stock market. Therefore, it's a great way to diversify your portfolio. The only problem, the high-end art market has only been accessible to the extremely wealthy until now. Masterworks is the first and only art investment platform that allows people like you and me to invest in multi-million dollar paintings by artists like Banksy, Monet, Warhol, and Basquiat. The Masterworks team of experts find financially attractive works that they believe will appreciate in value, acquire those paintings with a range from $1 million to $30 million and convert them into securities by the SEC. Members of Masterworks buy shares in that artwork and when sold, any potential profits go to the investors. Additionally, they have a secondary market where you can sell your shares to another member. It's easy to get started, just takes a few clicks and by clicking the link in the description down below, you can gain priority access and get a special offer. FYI, this is not investment advice, Advice, you should do your own research when it comes to managing your own money. Thanks, Masterworks. Now back to the bill. Another big issue that I had with the old elevator table is that I, I really didn't like how the leaves turned out. They work, but there were a lot of Band-Aid fixes on that, and I knew that there had to be a simpler solution. I had a bunch of people reached out. Thank you very much if you sent me photos of the leaves from your dining room table. I had a lot of those, and they helped a, a ton. Also, my buddy Sean sent me a 1977 article uh, from Fine Woodworking on the Dutch pull-out leaf system, which was also very helpful. Thank you, Sean. And uh, I watched a couple videos here and there, and I ended up kind of hybridizing all those different designs and coming up with this version that I felt like was going to work a lot better, but I had to build a prototype first just to make sure. The main thing that I was missing in the original design was that I, I had made the leaf and the tabletop interact with each other. I need them to be independent so that when I, you press down on the leaf, you're not lifting up the tabletop. So I put a crossbar in there and that seemed to solve a lot of the problem. Next, I started in on what I'm calling the upper apron assembly. This is what sits underneath the tabletop and supports the leaf structure as well as the, the tabletop and is what connects the lift arms to the leg assembly. This gets a decorative bevel on one end just to make it look a little bit nicer and dowel holes at either end that line up with the, the dowel holes and the pivot arms. I tested out the movement of the upper apron assembly just to get the spacing right on the, the apron rails. And, and then once they were sort of in the right spot where they were loose enough, but not too loose, I, I measured them out and then cut down the stretcher that's gonna go across there. This stretcher keeps the tabletop at its, at its height and then also allows room for those leaves to, to insert when they're not in use. the location for the dominoes to permanently install this stretcher, I added in a 16th inch shim between the stretcher and the pivot arm just to give it enough room so it's not binding anywhere, made the marks, and then I could mortise out the domino holes. With the apron assembly dry fit, I can measure out for the crossbar and cut it to size. This again is going to be the part that holds the leaves when they're fully extended. Picking through the remainder of the walnut, I found a couple of pieces that would be perfect for the leaf supports. 
since I made that mock-up earlier, I was able to use one of the leaf supports as a template. And I just traced that out on a couple of these pieces and could rough cut them on the bandsaw. The leaves need six leaf supports, three for each side. And I just ran through each one individually, double stick taped them to that template, and then template routed them out. I set the depth stop in my drill press to just about a quarter inch off the bottom, and I drilled both holes with that same setting so that I'll be able to use the same size screw for both holes. The apron rail is gonna get a notch that corresponds with the bevel of the leaf support. And for that, I just like to take real world measurements. So I laid out all of the leaf supports, traced them out on the surface of it, and uh, then could disassemble the apron assembly to cut it out on my table saw. So obviously the table saw is not cutting a bevel right now, but it is very good at notching out dados. So I'm notching out the dado first on the table saw, and then I'm gonna complete the rest of the bevel with some hand tools. So I got a problem. I, I did a dry fit off camera of these and um, the geometry is just slightly off. It's so close, but I'm getting about an eighth inch gap here. And it's enough that I think I need to remake all of them. Um, I'm not excited about it, but I also want to solve this before I put out plans on how to make this thing. So that's just the way that it goes, but it's a bit of a setback. Um, it's probably, I don't know, a couple hours of work, so I might as well just accept it and get started. Ugh. So that bevel angle, I had issues with this on the first build as well. It's really finicky uh, to get it nice and flat. And so what I found was that if I put a 16th inch handy shim inside of the slot, I got a really nice flat tabletop. But without that, there's a, about a 16th inch gap, which makes sense, right? So what I did was I, I remade the template, uh, re-template routed a bunch of new pieces, and those worked a lot better. It was a good bit of work, but it was well worth it in the end because the table ended up lining up perfectly. I honestly didn't count how many times I put the upper apron assembly together and took it apart again, but it was several. And this time I'm, I'm removing it so that I can drill some holes for the dowels that are gonna support the tabletop. Since this tabletop is so large, I don't have enough room to put it in my drill press, so I'm using this Rockler drill guide, which is a great solution if you don't have a drill press in your shop or if you need it for applications like this. I can set the depth stop on it and uh, it drills a nice clean square hole in the middle of this tabletop. 
So I double checked to make sure that those holes were in the right spot. And after that, I just had one more thing to do before I can glue up this assembly. I added a couple roundovers to the bottom of the apron, making sure not to cross over where that stretcher lines up. I'm gonna fix that after it's glued up. And then I can actually glue up this apron assembly and not have to take it apart ever again. Now you can see a little better what I was talking about with that stretcher. I just wanted to make sure that these roundovers met the stretcher as opposed to crossed over and then left a little gap. So this is easy to do with a carving knife and then afterwards I went over with some sandpaper to, to clean it up. Now I'm shifting focus to the leaves and the tabletop, rounding over all those corners and prepping it so that it's, it's ready to be installed in the table. There was one knot hole that I really could not figure out how to avoid in my milling and that was dead center in one of the boards and it went all the way through. So I decided to use a bit of epoxy. I tried out using vinyl tape on the underside, assuming that the vinyl tape wouldn't stick to it. I also tested out using charcoal powder, which this was just a stick of drawing charcoal mashed up uh, as a dye for the epoxy. I'm using Total Boat Epoxy Resin for this, and I've got the pumps on the two-part system, so it automatically fills the right amount into your cup. And after that, I just stir it a ton and add in as much of the black powder as I can to, to get it as dark as possible. I built this little funnel out of blue tape, poured it in, and let it set up for a couple of hours. I think I probably waited three or four hours and then it was tacky enough that I could just peel that tape away and only leave enough resin to harden overnight. The next morning I came in and started with a chisel uh, this stuff is pretty hard though, and so I got through it a little bit. I was worried that I was going to muck up the tabletop if I if I worked too much harder. Maybe I should sharpen this chisel, but uh, went over the top of it with a sander, and that that worked even better. I'm really happy with how that turned out, and I'm even happier with how the underside turned out. Oh wow. Uh. Yeah, didn't stick at all. That's cool. Since the upper pivot dowels are visible on the table, I really wanted to make these out of walnut. And I didn't have any walnut dowels, half inch walnut dowels in the shop. Uh, so I decided to make my own and I watched a couple videos. I found Izzy Swan's video, I'll link to it right here. And uh, he took me through all the steps that I needed to, to make my own dowel jig. This was super quick to make, really fun to use and the results were beautiful. In so many ways, this table is a lot simpler than the old model. I used floating screws in the first version, and this is something I saw in those photos that people sent me of just floating dowels. This is way simpler, it's way better looking, and I think it's gonna work super well. The taper allows you to move the apron assembly up and down as you remove the leaves and the, the taper sort of locks it into place when it's in the lowest position and when it's the highest position, it's got the most amount of play. 
I also really like the idea that this is being built with very few pieces of metal. It's almost entirely wood. The only pieces of metal are these 12 screws that I'm putting in to attach the leaf supports. The first side of the leaves seemed to be working pretty well, so I felt confident enough to screw in the second side. I'm using pan head screws here, so they lay flat on the, on the bottom there, and they're recessed enough so that they don't mess with the track at all. The second side was pretty tight. Uh, I was a little concerned, but I, I think that just with some sanding, and of course in the end I'm going to add wax. So uh, I wasn't too worried about that, but then I flipped it over and I found a much bigger problem. I had to remove the tabletop to even see what was going on, but the, the leaf closest to me kept uh, sort of snagging underneath there. And once I removed the tabletop, I could see that it was just getting lodged underneath the opposing leaf supports. And for some reason, they weren't sort of settling right. So you sit lower than that. Hmm. Oh, I think I know what I can do. The solution that I came up with was pretty simple. I just chamfered the edges of these pieces and that gave enough uh, room for this to sort of slide. It, it kind of gives the structure a bit of, uh, a bit of play. And uh, as a result, they went in a lot smoother and they were able to pass each other without any problem. So I went around and did that to the rest of the leaf supports, made sure that they were all chamfered, and I think I chamfered all four sides of all of them just to keep it looking consistent. After testing out the tabletop several times, I felt confident enough to start finishing it. I'm using Rubio Monocoat. This is an old can, so it's a little bit chunky. Probably time to throw it out, uh, but if you know Rubio, it's very expensive. So I'm going to use this up, and then on my next table, I'll use a fresh can. This goes on in one pass, which is super nice. It's also really durable. It's great for tabletops. And uh, as long as you make sure and get plenty of coverage, you're not going to have to recoat it. Every once in a while, I've seen a walnut go a little bit cloudy if you don't get enough coverage. But I was pretty thorough with this, took my time, covered all the surfaces, and that was it. One coat and you're done. I gave the table a couple days to dry and then I could assemble it. This is a walnut colored felt that I found online. I'll post a link down below and this is just going to prevent the leaves from beginning, getting scratched as they go in and out. I can then install the lift arms in the way that I figured out. Oh my god, it's so much nicer. And then I can add in the dowels. I made these extra tight so they'll, they're less likely to, to wear out over time. 
And on the inside of those dowels, I added a bit of that felt too, just so that when it comes down, it's, it's a little more padded. I also added wax to all the moving parts. This is gonna help with a lot of the movement of this, and it's something that I'll reapply over time. After that, I can add in the leaves and the tabletop, which will stay in this sort of removable fashion. So if you need to move the table around, it's a lot lighter to move. And then after that, I just have to put it in a living room. This was a massive challenge, a massive undertaking, and I am so happy with how it turned out. It works way better than the first one, and I thought that this was gonna be easy because I'd already built one, but no. <laughs> this took me a solid month to build, almost as long as the original, but again, I'm so happy. Plans are available on my website. It is probably the best set of plans I've ever built. I poured myself into them because I wanted to get it right, and I uh, hope you guys enjoy it. And there's also plans for the tenoning jig if you need that too. I'm really curious if you guys have ideas for other convertible types of furniture. It seems to be the sort of thing I'm attracted to. I've made the Murphy bar, two Murphy beds, and now the elevator table. So I would love if you've got other ideas for convertible furniture, let me know in the comments down below. A big thank you to Masterworks for sponsoring this video. And as always, a huge thank you to my Patreon supporters. You guys are the best and I'll catch you on the next one. Bye.